My, uh, my battle with pancreatic cancer started about a year and a half ago. Fought, did all the right things, but it's, you know, as my oncologist said, if you could pick off a list, that's not the one you'd want to pick. And the doctors at that time said, uh, you are likely to have three to, I love the, the way they say it, you have three to six months of good health left. Right? Optimism and, and positive phrasing. It's sort of like when you're at Disney, what time does the park close? The park is open until eight. <laughs> So I have three to six months of good health. Well, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, you know, this is not like the lecture that you may have seen me give before. This is a very pragmatic lecture. And one of the reasons that I had agreed to come back and give this is because Gabe had told me that, you know, and many other faculty members had told me that they had gotten so much tangible value about how to get more done. And I truly do believe that time is the only commodity that matters. So I'm going to talk specifically about how to set goals, how to avoid wasting time, how to deal with a boss. Originally, this talk was how to deal with your advisor, but I've tried to broaden it so it's not quite so academically focused, uh, and how to delegate to people. Uh, some specific skills and tools that I might recommend to help you get more out of the day, and to deal with the real problems in our life, which are stress and procrastination. I mean, if you can lick that last one, you're probably in good shape. First thing I want to say is that Americans are very, very bad at dealing with time as a commodity. We're really good at dealing with money as a commodity. I mean, we're, as a, as a culture, very interested in money and how much somebody earns is a status thing and so on and so forth. But we don't really have time elevated to that. People waste their time uh, and, and it just always fascinates me. And one of the things that I noticed is that very few people equate time and money and they're very, very equatable. So the first thing I started doing when I was a teacher was asking my graduate students, well, how much is your time worth an hour? Or if you work at a company, how much is your time worth to the company? What most people don't realize is that if you have a salary, let's say you make $50,000 a year, it probably costs that company twice that in order to have you as an employee because there's heating and lighting and other staff members and so forth. So if you get paid $50,000 a year, you are costing that company. They, make, they have to raise $100,000 in revenue. And if you divide that by your hourly rate, you begin to get some sense of what you are worth an hour. And when you have to make trade-offs of, should I do something like write software, or should I just buy it, or should I outsource this, having in your head what you cost your organization an hour is really kind of a, a staggering thing to change your behavior, because you start realizing that, wow, if I free up three hours of my time, and I'm thinking of that in terms of dollars, that's a big savings. So start thinking about your time and your money almost as if they are the same thing. So you've got to manage it, and you've got to manage it just like you manage your money. Now, I realize not all Americans manage their money. That's what makes the credit card industry possible. Uh, and, and, that's, and apparently mortgages, too. So, but most people do at least understand. They, they don't look at you funny if you say, well, can I see your monetary budget for your household? In fact, if I say your, your household budget, you presume that I'm talking about money, when in fact the household budget I really want to talk about is probably your household time budget. Uh, at the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, students would come in, and during the orientation, I would say, this is a master's program. Everybody's paying full tuition, and uh, it was roughly $30,000 a year. And, and the first thing I would say is, if you're going to come into my office and say, I don't think this is worth $60,000 a year, I will throw you out of the office. I'm not even going to have that discussion. And of course, they would say, oh, God, this Pouch guy's a real jerk. And they, they were right. But <laughs> what I then followed on with was, because the money is not important you can go and earn more money later. And what you'll never do is get the two years of your life back. So if you want to come into my office and talk about the money, I'll throw you out. But if you want to come into my office and say, I'm not sure this is a good place for me to spend two years, I will talk to you all day and all night because that means we're talking about the right thing, which is your time, because you can't ever get it back. So a lot of this only makes sense later. And uh, when I talk about your boss, if you're a student, think about that as your academic advisor. If you're a PhD student, think of that as your PhD advisor. And uh, if, you're, you know, if you're watching this and you're a young child, think of this as your parent, because that's sort of the person who is in some sense your boss. And the, the talk goes very fast, and I, as I said, I'm very big on specific techniques. I'm not really big on platitudes. I mean, platitudes are nice, but they don't really help me get something done tomorrow. I like to talk about the time famine. I think it's a nice phrase. Does anybody here feel like they have too much time? OK, nobody, excellent. And I like the word famine because it's a little bit like thinking about Africa. I mean, you can airlift all the food you want in to solve the crisis this week, 
but the problem is systemic, and you really need systemic solutions. So a time management solution that says, oh, I'm gonna fix things for you in the next 24 hours is laughable, just like saying I'm gonna cure hunger in Africa in the next year. You need to think long-term and you need to change fundamental underlying processes because the problem is systemic. We just have too many things to do and not enough time to do them. The other thing to remember is that it's not just about time management. That sounds like a kind of a lukewarm, you know, a talk on time management. That's kind of, you know, milk toast. But how about if the talk is, how about not having ulcers? All right, that catches my attention. Uh, so a lot of this is life advice. This is how to change the way you're doing a lot of the things and how you allocate your time so that you will lead a, a happier, more wonderful life. And I loved in the introduction that you talked about fun. Because if I've brought fun to academia, well, it's about damn time. <laughs> Whew. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're not gonna have fun, why do it? Right? That's what I want to know. I mean, life really is too short. If you're not going to enjoy it, you know, people who say, well, I'm, you know, I've got a job, but I don't really like it. And I'm like, well, you could change. <laughs> well, that would be a lot of work. You're right. You should keep going to work every day doing a job you don't like. Thank you. Good night. Right? Uh, so the overall goal is fun. Um, my middle child, Logan, is, is my favorite example. I don't think he knows how to not have fun. Now, granted, a lot of the things he does are not fun for his mother and me. <laughs> But he's loving every second of it. And he doesn't know how to do anything that isn't ballistic and full of life. And he's going to keep that quality, I think. He's my little tigger. And uh, I always remember Logan when I think about the goal is to make sure that you lead your life. You know, I want to maximize use of time, but really that's the means, not the end. The end is maximizing fun. People who do intense studies and, and log people and videotape them and so on and so forth say that the typical office worker wastes almost two hours a day. Right? Their desk is messy, they can't find things, misappointments, unprepared for meetings, they, they can't concentrate. Does anybody in here, by show of hands, ever have any sense that one of these things is part of their life? <laughs> okay, I think we've got everybody. So this is a universal thing and you shouldn't feel guilty if some of these things are plaguing you because they plague all of us. They plagued me for sure. And the other thing I want to tell you is that uh, it sounds a little cliched and trite, but being successful does not make you manage your time well. Managing your time well makes you successful. If I have been successful in my career, I assure you it's not because I'm smarter than all the other faculty. I mean, I'm looking around and looking at some of my former colleagues. I mean, I see Jim Cahoon up there. I am not smarter than Jim Cahoon, okay? <laughs> You know, I, I constantly look around the faculty at places like the University of Virginia or Carnegie Mellon, and I go, damn, these are smart people, right? And I snuck in. Uh, <laughs> but what I like to think I'm good at is the meta skills, because if you're going to have to run with people who are faster than you, you have to, like, find the right ways to optimize what skills you do have. So let's talk first about goals, priorities, and planning. Anytime anything crosses your life, you've got to ask, this thing I'm thinking about doing, why am I doing it? Almost no one that I know starts with the core principle of there's this thing on my to-do list, why is it there? Because if you start asking, well, why is it? I mean, again, my kids are great at this. That's all I ever hear at home is why, 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 right? And sooner or later, they're going to stop saying why, and they're just going to say, okay, I'll do it, right? Uh, so ask why am I doing this? What is the goal? Why will I succeed at doing it? And here's my favorite. What will happen if I don't do it? If I just say, yeah, I'm just not, the best thing in the world is when I have something on my to-do list, and I just go, mm, no. <laughs> no one has ever come and taken me to jail. Uh, I talked my way out of a speeding ticket last week. It was really cool. <laughs> it's like the closest I'm ever going to be to attractive and blonde. <laughs> and I, I told the guy, you know, why we had just moved and so on and so forth, and he looked at me and he said, well, for a guy who's only got a couple of months to live, you sure look good. <laughs> and I just pulled up my shirt to show the scar, and I said, yeah, I look good on the outside, but the tumors are on the inside. <laughs> you know, he just ran back to his cruiser. And <laughs> <laughs> so that's one positive law enforcement experience for me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the police have never come because I crossed something off my to-do list. And, and that's a very powerful thing because you just get all that time back. The other thing to keep in mind when you're doing goal setting is a lot of people focus on doing things right. And I think it's very dangerous to focus on doing things right. I think it's much more important to do the right things. If you do the right things adequately, that's much more important than doing the wrong things beautifully. All right? It doesn't matter how well you polish the underside of the banister. Okay? And keep that in mind. 
Uh, Lou Holtz had a, a great list. Uh, Lou Holtz has 100 things to do in his life. And he would sort of once a week look at it and say, you know, if I'm not working on the, those 100 things, why was I working on the others? And I just think that's a, an incredible way to frame things. Uh, there's something called the 80-20 rule. Sometimes you'll hear about the 90-10 rule. But the key thing to understand is that a very small number of things in your life or on your to-do list are going to contribute the vast majority of the value. So if, you have, if you're a salesperson, 80% of the revenue is going to come from 20% of your clients. And you better figure out who those 20% are and spend all of your time sucking up to them because that's where the revenue comes. Uh, so you've got to really be willing to say, this stuff is what's going to be the value and this other stuff isn't. And you've got to have the courage of your convictions to say, and therefore, I'm going to shove the other stuff off of the boat. The other thing to remember is that uh, experience comes with time, and it's really, really valuable, and there are no shortcuts to getting it. So good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So if things aren't going well, that probably means you're learning a lot and it'll go better later. <laughs> uh, this is, by the way, why we pay so much in American society for people who are you know, typically older but have done lots of things in their past because we're paying for their experience because we know that experience is one of the things you can't fake. And do not lose, the sight, do not lose sight of the power of inspiration. So Randy's in a in an hour-long talk, and you know, we've already hit our first Disney reference. Uh, <laughs> Walt, Disney's, uh, quote, Walt Disney has many great quotes, but one I loved is, if you can dream it, you can do it. And a lot of my cynical friends say, yada, 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 to which I say, shut up. <laughs> All right. Inspiration is important, and I'll tell you this much, if you, I don't know if Walt was right, but I'll tell you this much, if you refuse to allow yourself to dream it, I know you won't do it. So the power of dreams are that they give us a way to take the first step towards an accomplishment. And Walt was also not just a dreamer. Walt worked really hard. Uh, Disneyland, this amazes me, because I know a little bit about how hard it is to put theme park attractions together. And they did the whole original Disneyland park in 366 days. That's from the first shovel full of dirt to the first paid admission. All right? Think about how long it takes to do something, say, at a state university. <laughs> By comparison. So it, uh, you know, it's just fascinating. When someone once asked Walt Disney, how did you get it done in 366 days? He just deadpanned, we used every one of them. Right. So again, there are no shortcuts. shortcuts. There's a lot of hard work in anything you want to accomplish. All right. Planning is very important. One of the time management cliches is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And planning has to be done at multiple levels. I have a plan every morning when I wake up and I say, what do I need to get done today? What do I need to get done this week? What do I need to get done each semester? That's sort of the time quanta because I'm an academic. And that doesn't mean you're locked into it. And people say, well, yeah, but things are so fluid. You know, I'm going to have to change the plan. And I'm like, yes, you are going to have to change the plan. But you can't change it unless you have it. And the excuse of I'm not going to make a plan because things might change is just this paralysis of I don't have any marching orders. So have a plan, acknowledge that you're going to change it, but have it so you have the basis to start with. To-do lists. How many people here right now, if I said, can you produce it, could show me their to-do list? OK, not bad. Not bad. The key thing with to-do lists is you have to break things down into small steps. Uh, I literally, once on my to-do list when I was a junior faculty member here at the University of Virginia, I put, get tenure. <laughs> that, that was naive. <laughs> um, and I, I looked at that for a while and I said, oh, that's really hard. I don't think I can do that. Uh, and um, my children, Dylan and Logan and Chloe, particularly uh, Dylan, is at the age where he can clean his own damn room, thank you very much. But he doesn't like to. And uh, Chris is smiling because I used to do this story on him, but now I've got my own kids to pick on. Uh, <laughs> but Dylan will come to me and say, I can't pick up my room. It's too much stuff. <sighs> he's not even a teenager, and he's already got that move. You know? <sighs> and I say, well, can you make your bed? Yeah, I can do that. OK, can you put all the clothes in the hamper? Yeah, I can do that. And you, know, you do three or four things, and then it's like, well, Dylan, you just cleaned your room. I cleaned my room. Right? And he feels good. He is empowered. Uh, and everybody's happy. And of course, I've had to spend twice as much time 
managing him as I could have done it by myself, but that's okay. That's what being a boss is about, is growing your people, no matter how small or large they might be at the time. <laughs> the last thing about to-do lists or getting yourself going is if you've got a bunch of things to do, do the ugliest thing first. There's an old saying, if you have to eat a frog, don't spend a lot of time looking at it first. And if you have to eat three of them, don't start with the small one. All right, this is the most important slide in the entire talk. So if you want to leave after this slide, I will not be offended because it's all downhill from here. And this is blatantly stolen. This is Stephen Covey's great contribution to the world. He talks about it in the, one, in, um, uh, the Seven Habits book. Uh, it's imagine your to-do list. Most people sort their to-do list either, you know, the order that I, I got it, throw it on the bottom, or they sort it in due date list, which is more sophisticated and more helpful but still very, very wrong. So looking at the four quadrant to-do list, if you've got a quadrant where things are important, excuse me, and due soon, important and not due soon, not important and due soon, and not important and not due soon, all right, uh, which of these four quadrants do you think, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, which one do you think you should work on immediately? Okay. Upper left, <laughs> you are such a great crowd, okay. And which one do you think you should probably do last? Lower right. And that's, you know, that's easy. That's obviously number one. That's obviously number four. But this is where everybody in my experience gets it wrong. What we do now is we say, I do the number ones, and then I move on to the stuff that's due soon and not important. When you write it in this quadrant list, it's really stunning, because I've actually seen people do this, and they say, okay, and this is due soon, and I know it's not important, so I'm going to get right to work on it. <laughs> and the most crucial thing I can teach you about time management is when you're done picking off the important and due soon, that's when you go here. You go to it's not due soon and it's important, and there will be a moment in your life where you say, hey, this thing that's due soon but not important, I won't do it. Because it's not important. It says so right here on the chart. <laughs> And magically, you have time to work on the thing that is not due soon but is important so that next week, it never got a chance to get here because you killed it in the crib. My wife won't like that metaphor. Uh, <laughs> but you kill the, or you, you, you solve the problem of something that's due next week when you're not under time stress because it's not due tomorrow. And suddenly, you become one of those zen-like people who just always seem to have all the time in the world, because they've figured this out. All right, paperwork. The first thing you need to know is that having cluttered paperwork leads to thrashing. You end up with all these things on your desk, and you can't find anything, and the moment you turn to your desk, your desk is saying to you, I own you. <laughs> I have more things than you can do. <laughs> and they are many colors and laid out. Uh, so what I find is that it's really crucial to keep your desk clear, and we'll talk about where all the paper goes in a second, and you have one thing on your desk, because then it's like, ha, ah, now it's Thunderdome. Me and the one piece of paper, right? And so I usually win that one. Uh, one of the mantras of time management is touch each piece of paper once. You get the piece of paper, you look at it, you, you work at it, and I think that's extremely true for email. How many people here well, I'm going to take it for granted that everybody here has an email inbox. How many people right now have more than 20 items in their email inbox? <laughs> oh, I'm in the right room. <laughs> your inbox is not your to-do list. And I, my wife has learned that I need to get my inbox clear. Now, sometimes this really means just filing things away and putting something on my to-do list. But remember, the to-do list is sorted by importance, but my e does anybody here have an, e have an email program where you can press the sort by importance button? You know, it, it, it's amazing how people who build software that really is a huge part of our life and getting work done haven't a clue. And I, that's not a slam on any particular company. I think they all have missed the boat, and I just find it fascinating. Uh, because everybody I know, or most people I know, have this inbox that, all right, I gotta ask, how many people have more than 100 things in their email inbox? <laughs> oh, I'm just not gonna keep going, this is too depressing. <clears throat> um, so, you really wanna get the thing in your inbox, look at it and say, 
I'm either going to read it right now or I'm going to file it and put an entry in my to-do list. And, and that's just a crucial thing, because otherwise, every time you go to read your email, you're just swamped, and it's just as bad as the cluttered paper. You're all trying to figure out how that heading goes with that picture. A filing system is absolutely essential. And I know this because I married the most wonderful woman in the world, but she's not a good filer. <laughs> but she is now, because... <laughs> After we got married and we moved in together and we resolved all the other typical couple things, I said, we have to have a place where our papers go and it's in alphabetical order. And she said, well, that sounds a little compulsive. <laughs> and I said, okay, honey. So I went out to Ikea and I got this big, nice, way too expensive, big wooden, fake mahogany thing with big drawers. So she liked it because it looked kind of nice. And having a place in our house where any piece of paper went and was in alphabetical order did wonderful things for our marriage. Because there was never any of this, honey, where did you put blah, 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 right? And there was never being mad at somebody because they had put something in someone else's place. There was an expected place for it. And when you're looking for important receipts or whatever it is, this is actually important. And uh, we have found that this has been uh, a wonderful thing for us. I think file systems among groups of people, whether it's a marriage or an office, are crucial. But even if it's just you, having a place where you know you put something really beats all hell out of running around for an hour going, where is it? I know it's blue, and I was eating something when I read it. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is not a filing system. This is madness. A lot of people ask me, so Randy, what does your desk look like? So. As my wife would say, this is what Randy's desk looks like when he's photographing it for a talk. Uh, uh, the important thing is that I'm a computer geek, so I have the desk off to the right, and then I have the computer station off to the left. I like to have my desk in front of a window whenever I can do that. Uh, this is an old photograph. These have now been replaced by LCD monitors, but I left the old picture because the crucial thing is it doesn't matter if they're fancy high tech. The key thing is screen space. Lots of people have studied this. How many people in this room have more than one monitor on their computer desktop? Okay, not bad. So we're getting there. It's starting to happen. Uh, what I've found is that I could go back from three to two, but I just can't go back to one. There's just too many things. And as somebody said, it's the difference between working on a desk like at home, and trying to get work done on the little tray on an airplane. In principle, the little tray on the airplane is big enough for everything you need to do. It's just that in practice, it's, it's pretty small. So multiple monitors, I think, are very important. And I'll show you in a second what I have on each one of those. Uh, and I believe in this multiple monitor thing. We believed in it for a long time. That's, uh, that's my research group, um, our, our laboratory a long time ago at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that's Caitlin Kelleher, who's now Dr. Kelleher, thank you, and she's at Washington University in St. Louis uh, doing, doing wonderful things. Uh, but we, we had everybody with three monitors, and the cost on this is absolutely trivial. If you figure the cost of adding a second monitor to an employee's yearly cost to the company, it's not even 1% anymore. So why would you not do it? So one of my walkaways for all of you is you should all go to your boss and say, I need a second monitor. I just can't work without it. Randy told me to tell you that. Because <laughs> right. it, it will increase your productivity, and the computers can all drive two monitors, so why not? So what do I have on my three monitors? On the left is my to-do list, uh, all sorts of stuff in there. Um, and my system, we're all idiosyncratic, my system is that I just put a number zero through nine and I use an editor that can quickly sort on that number in the first column. But the key thing is it's sorted by priority. In the middle is my mail program. Note the empty inbox. <laughs> and I try very hard. I sleep better if I go to sleep with the inbox empty. When my inbox does creep up, I get really testy. So my wife will actually say to me, I think you need to clear the inbox. <laughs> on the third one is a calendar. That's, uh, this is from a number of years ago, but that's kind of like what my, my, uh, my days would be. I used to be very heavily booked. And I don't care which software you use. I don't which, care which calendar you use. I don't care if it's paper or computer. Whatever works for you, but you should have some system whereby you know where you're supposed to be next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Because even if you can live your life without that, you're using up a lot of your brain to remember all that. And I don't know about you, but I don't have enough brain to spare to use it on things I can have paper or computers do for me. 
Uh, so back to the overview. Uh, on the desk itself, let's zoom in a little bit. Look, I have the one and one thing I'm working on at the time. Uh, I have a speakerphone. This is crucial. How many people here have a speakerphone on their desks? Okay, not bad, but a lot more people don't. Speaker phones are essentially free, and uh, I spend a lot of time on hold, and that's because I live in American society where I get to listen to messages of the form, your call is extremely important to us. <laughs> Watch while my actions are cognitively dissonant from my words. <laughs> you know, it's like the worst abusive relationship in the world. I mean, imagine a guy picks you up on the first date and he smacks you in the mouth and says, I love you, honey. That's, that's pretty much how modern customer service works on the telephone. Uh, but the great thing about a speakerphone is you hit the speakerphone and you dial, and then you just do something else. And if it takes seven minutes, it takes seven minutes. And hey, I just look at this as somebody's piping music into my office. That's very nice of them. Uh, I also found that having a timer on the clock uh, on, the, on the phone is handy so that when somebody finally picks up in Bangalore, I can... Uh, <laughs> I, I can say things like, uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be talking with you. By the way, if you're keeping records on this sort of thing, I've been on hold for seven and a half minutes. But you don't say it angry, you just say it as I presume you're logging this kind of stuff. And you're not angry, so they don't get angry back at you, but they feel really guilty. And, and that's good, you want guilty, right? Uh, so a speakerphone is really great. I find that a speakerphone is probably the best material possession you can buy to counter stress. If I were like teaching a yoga and meditation class, I'd say, we'll do all the yoga and meditation. I think that's wonderful stuff. But everybody also has to have a speakerphone. <laughs> uh, what else do we have besides a speakerphone? Let's talk about telephones for a second. <clears throat> I think that the telephone is a great time waster. And I think it's very important to keep your business calls short. So I recommend standing during phone calls. Great for exercise. And if you tell yourself, I'm not going to sit down until the call is over, you'll be amazed how much brisker you are. Uh, start by announcing goals for the call. Hello, Sue, this is Randy. I'm calling you because I have three things that I wanted to get done. Boom, boom, boom. Because then you've given her an agenda. And when you're done with the three things, you can say, that's great. Those are the three things I had. It was great to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you again. Bye. Boom. We're off the phone. Whatever you do, do not put your feet up. I mean, if you put the feet up, you're, it's just all over. And the other handy trick is have something on your desk that you actually are kind of interested in going to do next. So that the phone call, instead of being, wow, I can get off the phone and go do some work, or I could keep chit-chatting. And usually the person you've called, they'd like to chit-chat too. Right? So this is where the time waster in the office goes. And if you're a grad student, <laughs> well, if you're a grad student, you already know about time wasting. Uh, <laughs> so having something you really want to do next is a great way to get you off the phone quicker. So you've got to train yourself. Uh, getting off the phone is hard for a lot of people. I don't suffer from an abundance of politeness. So my, my sister, who's known me for a long time, is laughing a knowing laugh. Uh, so uh, when I want to get off the phone, I want to get off the phone. I'm done. And uh, what I say is, you know, I'd, I'd love to keep talking with you, but I have some students waiting. Now, I'm a professor. Somewhere there must be students waiting. <laughs> Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be. Uh, now, sometimes you get in a situation like with a telemarketer, right? And uh, that's awkward because a lot of people are so polite. Now, I have no trouble with telemarketers. I'll just go there with them. Right? If you're a telemarketer and you call my house, you have made a mistake. <laughs> right? Yeah, I can't talk right now, but why don't you give me your home phone number and I'll call you back around dinner time. You know, <laughs> Seinfeld did a great bit on that. Or, or if you want to be a little bit more over the line, uh, I'd love to talk with you about that. But first, I have some things I'd like to sell you. <laughs> and the funny part is they never realize you're yanking with them. That's <laughs> uh, but if you have to hang up on a telemarketer, what you do is you hang up while you're talking. Well, I, I think that's really interesting, and I would love to keep, you know. <laughs> I mean, talk about self-effacing, <laughs> hanging up on yourself. And, and they won't figure it out. And if they do and they call back, just don't answer, right? So uh, a, uh, 10 years from now, all anybody will remember from this talk is hang up on yourself. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is group your phone calls. Call people right before lunch or right before the end of the day. Because then they have something they would rather do than keep chitty chatting with you. So I find that calling somebody at 11.50 is a great way to have a 10-minute phone call. 
Because frankly, you may think you're interesting, but you are not more interesting than lunch. <laughs> uh, I have become very obsessive about phones and using time productively. So I, I just think that everybody should have something like this. I don't care about fashion, so you know, I don't have Bluetooth. And you know, I have this big, ugly thing. Hi, I'm Julie from Time Life. right? Uh, <laughs> But the thing this allows me to do, because uh, you know, I am sort of living the limit case right now of I've got to get stuff done and I really don't have a lot of time. So uh, I get an hour a day where I exercise on my bike. And this is me on my bike. And if you look carefully, you can see I'm wearing that headset and I've got my cell phone. And for an hour a day, I ride my bike around the neighborhood. This is time that I'm spending on the phone getting work done. And it's not a moment being taken away from my wife or my children. And it turns out that I can talk and ride a bike at the same time. Amazing the skill sets I have. So uh, it works better in cold weather climate, in warm weather climates. But uh, I have just found that having a headset frees me up. Even if it's just around the house, you wear a headset, you can fold laundry. It's an absolute twofer. And uh, I just think uh, telephones should have headsets. And someday we will all have the Borg implant, and it will be a non-issue. Uh, what else is on my desk? I have sort of one of those address stampers because I got tired of writing my address. Uh, I have a box of Kleenex. In your box at work, if you're a faculty member, you have to have a box of Kleenex. Because if it, <laughs> Jim is laughing, right. Uh, you know, at least if you teach the way I do, <laughs> there will be crying students in your office. And, and what I found to diffuse a lot of that is that I would have CS352 or whatever written on the side of the Kleenex box. And I would turn it as I handed it to them. And they would take the Kleenex and they would be like, oh. I said, yeah, you're, you know, it's for the class. You know. <laughs> you're not alone. So having Kleenex is very important. Um, and thank you cards. Um, I'll now ask the embarrassment question. And I don't mean to pick on you, but it just points things out so well. By show of hands, who here has written a thank you note that is not a quid pro quo? I don't mean, oh, you gave me a gift. I wrote you a thank you note. And I mean a physical thank you note with a pen and ink and paper, not, not email. Because email's better than nothing, but it's that much better than nothing. Okay. Uh, how many people here have written a thank you note in the last week? Not bad. I do better here than at most places, because it is UVA. <laughs> Chivalry is not that. But that's not, how many people in the last month? How many people in the last year? The fact that there are a non-trivial number of hands not up for the year means that anybody who's in this audience, his parents are going, ooh, that was my kid. Uh, thank you notes are really important. Uh, they're, they're a very tangible way to tell someone how much you appreciated things. I have thank you notes with me, and that's because I'm actually writing some later today to some people who've done some nice things for me recently. And you say, well, God, do you have time for that? And I'm like, yes, I have time for that, because it's important. Even in my current status, I will make time to write thank you notes to people. And even if you're a crafty, weaselly bastard, you should still write thank you notes. Because it makes you so rare that when someone gets a thank you note, they will remember you. Right? It seems like the only place that thank you notes are really taken seriously anymore is when people are interviewing for jobs. They now sometimes write thank you notes to the recruiters, um, which I guess shows a sign of desperation on the part of the recent graduates. Uh, but thank you notes are a wonderful thing, and I would encourage all of you to go out and buy a stack at your local dime store and have them on your desk so that when the moment seizes you, it's right there. And I leave my thank you notes out on the desk readily accessible. Uh, and as I've said before, gratitude is something that can go beyond cards. When I got tenure here, I took my whole research team down to Disney World on my nickel for a week. And I just, I believe in large gestures, but you know, it's also, it was a lot of fun. I wanted to go too, right? Uh, scheduling yourself. Uh, verbs are important. You do not find time for important things. You make it. And you make time by electing not to do something else. There's a term from economics that everybody should hold near and dear to that heart, and that term is opportunity cost. The bad thing about doing something that isn't very valuable. It's not that it's a bad thing to have done it. The problem is that once you spend an hour doing it, that's an hour you can never again spend in any other way. And that's important. Now, how do you keep these unimportant things from sucking into your life? You learn to say no. It's great. My, uh, my youngest child, Chloe, is at an age where this is her new word. About two weeks ago, she learned it. And it's like, now everything is, no, 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 no. She should be giving this talk. <laughs> right? And I asked her, and she said, no. 
<coughs> so she's home playing, <laughs> all right? But we all hate to say no, because people ask us for help and we want to be gracious. So let me teach you some gentle no's. The first one is, I'll do it if I'm really strapped, but I want to help you. I don't want you to be in the bind. So if nobody else steps forward, I will do this for you. All right? Or I'll be your deep fallback, but you have to keep searching for somebody else. Now, you will find out about the person's character at that moment, because if they say, great, I got my sucker, and they stop looking, then they have abused the relationship. But if they say, that's great, my stress level is down at zero, because now I know it's not going to be a disaster, but I'm going to keep looking for somebody for whom it's less of an imposition. That's a person that will get lots of this sort of support. Okay? When uh, I was in graduate school, we did a moving party with four people. A lot of moving parties carry heavy objects. We had four people. We should have had 12. It was a long day. And after that, I adopted a new policy. I said, from now on, when somebody says, will you help me move, I'll say, how much stuff you got? And they would tell me, and I'd say, hmm, that sounds like about eight people. If you give me the names of seven other people that'll be there, I'll be there. And I never again was at a moving party that went for 14 hours in January in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> uh, everybody has good and bad times. Uh, a, a big thing about time management is find your creative time and defend it ruthlessly. Spend it alone, maybe at home if you have to, but uh, defend it ruthlessly. The other thing is find your dead time, schedule meetings, phone calls, exercise, mundane stuff. But do stuff during that where you don't need to be at your best. And we all have these times. And the times are not at all intuitive. I discovered that my most productive time was between 10 PM and midnight, which is really weird. But it's sort of this, for me, it's just this burst of energy right before the end. Let's talk about interruptions. Uh, an interruption, there are people who measure this kind of stuff, who have stopwatches and clipboards. And what they say is that an interruption takes typically six to nine minutes but then there's a four to five minute recovery to get your head back into what you're doing. And if you're doing something like software creation, you may never get your head back there. The cost can be infinity. <clears throat> but if you do the math on that, five interruptions blows a whole hour. So you've got to find ways to reduce both the frequency and the length of these interruptions. One of my favorites is turn phone calls into email. If you phone my office at Carnegie Mellon and it says, hi, this is Randy, um, please send me email. Uh, again, I presume everybody here has email. How many people here, when a new message comes in, does your computer go ding or make some other noise? Do we still have people doing that? What the heck is wrong with you people? <laughs> and, and I love the fact that computer scientists just know nothing about anything. So for years, by default, all these packages out of the box would go ding every time you get a new piece of email. So we had taken a technology explicitly designed to reduce interruption, and we'd turned them into interruptions. So you just got to turn that off. The whole point of email is you go to it when you're ready, not you're sitting around like Pavlov's dog saying, oh, maybe I'll get another email. <laughs> In the same way you try to not interrupt other people, I save stuff up so I have boxes for Tina or for my research group meeting, and I put stuff in those boxes, and then once a week or however often when the box gets full, I walk down the hall and I interrupt that person one time and say, here are the eight things I have for you. How do you cut things short? Because people will always want to spend more time than you want to spend. Well, you can say, look, somebody interrupts you and says, you know, got a few minutes, and they say, well, I'm in the middle of something right now. And that tells them, I'm interrupting it. I'm going to do it quickly, but I got to get back to that. Or you can say, I only have five minutes. The great thing about that is that later you have the privilege of extending that if you so choose. But when the five minutes are up, you can say, well, I said at the beginning I only had five minutes, and I really have to go now. So it's, it's a very socially polite way to bound the amount of time on the interaction. If somebody's in your office and they don't get it, now I'm not saying that as a computer scientist I have an inordinate amount of time to interact, opportunity to interact with people with no social skills. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, if you have someone in your office who is just not getting it, what you do is you stand up, you walk to the door, you compliment them. For some reason, this is a crucial part of the process. <laughs> you thank them and you shake their hand. And if they still don't leave, which is pretty much a guarantee that you're dealing with someone from my tribe, <laughs> then you're in the doorway, you just keep going. <laughs> <clears throat> what I have found is that people don't like it when you look at your watch while you're talking with them. 
So what I do is I put a wall on the clock right behind them so it's just off axis from their eyes and I can just kind of glance over a little bit when I need to see what time it is. It's a very nice way to get me information without being rude to them. Time journals. Time is the commodity. You better find out where your time is going. So monitor yourself and update it throughout the day. You can't wait till the end of the day and say, what was I doing at 10.30? Because our memories aren't that good. So what you do, and I really hope that technology within you know, another five years or so will be so good that the time journals can be created automatically, or at least some facsimile of it. But until then, what we do is we monitor it ourselves. So this is what an empty time journal would look like. The details aren't important, but the key thing is that when you fill it in, you've got a bunch of categories and what I was doing, and you can do this very informally, but you get a lot of real data about where your time went. And it's always very different. Anybody who's done monetary budgeting, you look at it and you go, wow, I didn't know I was spending that much on dry cleaning or restaurants. It's always a fascinating surprise. And you always spend more than you think. But with time budgets, you find out that the time is just going wildly differently than you would have imagined. The best example of this I know is uh, Turing Award winner Fred Brooks's time clocks. He's a brilliant computer scientist, but he also has this great array of clocks in his office. And when you go in and talk to him, he says, is, is this meeting about research or teaching or whatever? And then he flips the appropriate switch. And at the end of the week, he knows exactly where his time went. <laughs> the man is a genius. <clears throat> Uh, when, uh, when I meet with students, and this is, I think, just as appropriate for people in the workplace, I say, what's your schedule? You have a set of fixed meetings every, every time, every week, and what you have to do is you have to look at those and, and identify the, the open blocks where you're going to waste time, and I can tell you're going to waste time just by looking at it. So in this case, you've got a class where uh, you've got a class at a certain point, and then you've got a gap until the next class, so I've identified those here. And the gaps between classes that in this case last an hour or an hour and a half, this is just prime time to be wasted. So what I always taught my students was make up a fake class. The fake class is go to one specific place in the library during that hour. And when you're sitting there with just you in the library and your books, there's a pretty good chance you might actually study. So don't go and hang out with friends for an hour. Just make that a fake class. Make your own little study hall. It's a simple trick, but it's amazing how effective it is when somebody just explicitly does it. When you've got your time journal data, what do you figure out from that? What am I doing that doesn't need to be done? What can someone else do? I love every day sort of saying, what am I doing that I could delegate to somebody else? Um, my sister is again laughing because she knows who that person was in our youth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what can I do more efficiently? And how am I wasting other people's time? When you get good at time management, you realize that it's a collaborative thing. I want to make everybody more efficient. It's not a selfish thing. It's not me against you. It's how do we all collectively get more done? Uh, as you push on the time journal stuff, you start to find that you don't make yourself more efficient at work so you can become some sort of uber worker person. You become more efficient at work so you can leave at five and go home and be with the people that you love. People call this work-life balance. For the junior faculty, you may have heard of it <laughs> in some sort of mythical sense, but it is, it is possible. Uh, I found that I worked less, I worked fewer hours after I got married, and I got more done. And I was always fascinated in graduate school that the people who graduated fastest with their PhDs were the people who had a spouse and kids. And I said, how can that be? That's like a built-in boat anchor, <laughs> right? You know, you got all these other demands on your time, and I'm like a single guy, and I got all the time in the world, and that's the problem. I approach it like I got all the time in the world, so my time isn't precious. When you've got a spouse and little kids, your spouse is likely to say things to you like, you better not be in at that grad school more than 40 hours a week. So when you come in, you're not sitting around playing computer games. Not that I ever did that. <laughs> but when you come in, you're coming in and you're doing work. And I found, like most people, that once I got married and had kids, my whole view of time management really got, I mean, we were playing for real stakes now. Because now there are people whose lives are impacted if I'm spending too much time at work. Uh, the other thing about time management, it makes you really start to look through a crystalline lens and figure out what's important and what's not. So let's talk about procrastination. Uh, there's an old saying, procrastination is the thief of time. Procrastination is hard, and I have a little bit of an insight here for you. We don't usually procrastinate because we're lazy. Sometimes people rationalize their procrastination. They say, well, gee, if I wait long enough, maybe I won't have to do it. Right? That's true. Sometimes you get lucky. All right? Uh, but 
and other people say, gee, if I start on it now, I'm just going to spend all the time on it. If I, only, if I only give myself the last two days, I'll do it in two days, because that's the work expands to fill the time available, Parkinson's law. That's marginally true. But I think the key balance here is to understand that doing things at the last minute is really expensive. And it's just much more expensive than doing it just before the last minute. Uh, you have to realize that if you push things right up to the deadline, that's where all the stress comes from. Because now you can't reach people. Uh, if somebody is out of the office for just one day, your whole plan is upset. So you really have to work hard on this kind of stuff. The other thing is that deadlines are really important. We are all essentially deadline driven. So if you have something that isn't due for a long time, make up a fake deadline and act like it's real. And that's wonderful because those are the deadlines when push comes to shove. You can slip them by a couple of days and it's all right. So they're less stressful. If you are procrastinating, you've got to find some way to get back into your comfort zone. Identify why you're not enthusiastic. Whenever I procrastinate on something, there's always a deep psychological reason. Usually it's I'm afraid of being embarrassed because I don't think I'll do it well, or I'm afraid I'm going to fail at it. And sometimes it involves asking somebody for something. And one of the most magical things I've learned in my life is that sometimes you just have to ask, and wonderful things happen. But you just have to you know, step out and do that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I won the parent lottery. I have just wonderful parents. And my dad, unfortunately, passed away not too long ago. But this is one of my favorite photographs, because my dad was such a smart guy, I could almost never surprise him or impress him, because he was just that good. But we were down on a family vacation at Disney World, and the monorails were going by, and we're going to board the monorail. And we noticed that in the, uh, in the front up here in the cabin, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but there's an engineer who drives the monorail, and there were actually guests up in there with him, which is kind of unusual. My dad and I were talking about that, and I, I knew, because I've done some consulting for Disney. My dad's saying, oh, they probably have to be special VIPs or something like that. I said, oh, there is a trick. There is a special way you get into that cabin. And he said, really, what is it? And I said, I'll show you. Dylan, come with me. And Dylan, who's, who's the back of his head, you can see there, we walk up and I whisper to Dylan, ask the man if we can ride in the front. <laughs> and we go up to the attendant and the attendant says, why, yes, you can. And he opens the gate and my dad is just like. <laughs> I said, I told you there was a trick. I didn't say it was hard. <laughs> and sometimes all you have to do is ask. And it's that easy. Here's some of my most important advice. We close with some of the best stuff. Kill your television. People who study this say the average American watches 28 hours of television a week. That's almost three quarters of a full-time job. So uh, if you really want to get time back in your life, you don't have to kill your television, but just unplug it, put it in the closet, and put a blanket over it. See how long it takes you to get the shakes. Uh, turn money into time, especially junior faculty members or other people who have young children. This is the time to throw money at the problem. Hire somebody else to mow your lawn. Do whatever you need to do, but exchange, time for, exchange money for time at every opportunity when you have very young children because you just don't have enough time. It's just too hard. And the other thing is eat and sleep and exercise. Above all else, you always have time to sleep because if you get sleep deprived, Everything falls apart. Other general advice, never break a promise, but renegotiate them if need be. If you've said, I'll have this done by Tuesday at noon, you can call the person on Friday and say, I'm still good to my word, but I'm really jacked up. And I'm going to have to stay and work over the weekend to meet that Tuesday deadline. Is there any way there's any slack on that? And a lot of times they'll say, Thursday's fine. Because I really need it Thursday, but I told you Tuesday. <laughs> or they'll say, oh, it's no problem. I can have Jim do that instead of you. He has some free time. Now, if they say, no, I, there's no wiggle room here, you say, that's OK, no problem. I'm still good to my word. All right? If you haven't got time to write, do it right, you don't have time to do it wrong. That's self-evident. Uh, recognize that most things are pass-fail. People spend way too much time. There's a reason we have the expression, good enough. It's because the thing is good enough. And the last thing is get feedback loops. Ask people in confidence. Because if someone will tell you what you're doing right or doing wrong, and they'll tell you the truth, that's worth more than anything else in the whole world. And the last thing is, once you've got your day timer, make a note for 30 days from today. It's OK if that one goes ding, to remind you. And revisit this talk in 30 days. It'll be up on the web, courtesy of Gabe. And ask, what have I changed? And if I haven't changed anything, then we still had a pleasant hour together. If you have changed things, then you'll probably have a lot more time to spend with the ones you love. And that's important. Time is all we have.
and you may find one day you have less than you think. Thank you.